Microsoft's inclusion of ADFS in this 70-412 exam is, I don't know, to put it in a word, I would call it a bit ridiculous. And I say that because I think I mentioned in, earlier in this series that ADFS is one of those technologies that it's kind of like RMS. You just don't enter into this technology lightly. And uh, actually, as I was kind of doing some of the, the looking around for, for prepping this nugget, it, an old test-taking philosophy came to mind that seems to fit very well in as, to this topic of ADFS, just because of the sheer complexity that's required in order to get even the most basic of demonstrations up and running. And, and that has to do with just taking a look at how much of the exam ADFS could be and where you should apply your, your studying time and efforts. If you think about this exam having something on the order of 60-ish questions or so and something on the order of 20-ish different topics, very discrete objective domains that you have to focus through. Uh, I think there are, what, 22 or so nuggets in this series, of which 21 of them are, are individual topics. So you figure that at 20-ish different topics, each topic is going to get somewhere south of about 5% of the total number of questions. You take that 5% and multiply it by 60, and you're likely to get somewhere around three questions on ADFS. So for an inordinately large, really complicated, overwhelming sort of topic that has everything to do or more to do with developers than it does with uh, IT pros, or, or a heavier amount to do with developers than does it IT pros, if you could pick one topic to just sort of skim through the basics, it would be this one, because it's entirely possible for you to get way too deep in with this content and really not glean out of it what's necessary for your ultimate goal, which is passing the exam. Now that said, for this nugget, I'm going to do something very different than what I normally do. Is I'm not going to go through a complete functioning scenario with you with ADFS because, again, I don't want to overwhelm you with the overload of detail that can happen when you start thinking about how you can get websites online and federation to work. Instead, I'm going to focus on the vocabulary of ADFS because that's really what I think Microsoft is intending to, to help you understand here. And this is but by no means to say that ADFS isn't important. ADFS is becoming very important in a lot of organizations these days, especially with the implications of things like Office 365. You know, a lot of organizations are looking to do federation of uh, authentication just so that they can have their local usernames and passwords work against their remote Office 365 resources. So I want to show you the vocabulary here. I want to give you a basic introduction of ADFS, how it works, um, the, the, the boxes on piece of paper, definition for how all these things interconnect, and then poke you through a couple of the, the check boxes here that you'll need to be aware of when it comes time to pass in this exam. If you intend on implementing ADFS in your organization, just as I said before with, um, with certificate services, it is entirely likely that the implementation of ADFS will be kind of recipe driven, meaning that the 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 application that you're intending on making federated will probably come with the necessary bits that are needed or the instructions that are needed to get federation turned on. Now, with that said, let, let's talk about just kind of the, the introduction to ADFS and how this ends up working. ADFS and federation in general is designed as a mechanism for helping you, so this is, this is you over here in uh, company.pri, to be able to extend authentication, to extend the ability to access resources to people that may sit out in other organizations. So here's another individual out there in some other organization. This is uh, company2.com. And there's some, you know, there's the internet separates you and this other person. And by no means are you and this other person or you and these two domains connected through any kind of Active Directory trust. There's, there's no need for it. There's no reason for it because, well, this is one company and you are another company. And you don't need to be able to connect your Active Directories together. Well, there comes times, uh, from time to time, where you need to give access to some sort of application, right? So I've got some application out here that the people in some other organization need to be able to access. And in order for you to do that, there are a couple different ways in which you can accomplish that. Like, obviously, the, the first of which is to create a whole database of users, uh, their, their passwords, and their accesses over here that's attached to this application itself. Now the problem here is when you do that, that's kind of the traditional model for how you would create an app, right? You, uh, you create the app and then you provide all the accesses based on usernames and passwords. But the problem here is this little guy over here, 
right? He belongs to company2.com. And in fact, there are probably a whole bunch of people over in company2.com that are needing to access this application. And the, the fact that these people exist in a different location, in a different company, and they don't even, they're not even required to follow your rules becomes a bit of a problem. Because if I'm creating usernames, and passwords, and accesses over here inside of my application, well, then I also have to manage the recognition of which of these users should have access. Right? So I can't see into company2.com. I can't actually look into that organization and see anything. Uh, how, do I, how am I to know that this third person over here suddenly decided to go bad? Like He's suddenly a, a bad systems admin with his bad black hat on. I don't know this because I'm not a member of this other company. The other company is probably not going to let me know because they don't want you to know that this person has actually gone bad. Or this person, the second person over here, decides to leave the company, so they're no longer around. Well, all of these different possibilities introduces the fact that, well, if I don't get that information here, my local username and password database can get out of sync with reality or can become less relevant. In the worst situation, where I've got bad people that are out no longer associated with the company, well, that database could actually become a point of, of contention or an issue because this bad person may still have access to the application that they no longer should. So because of that, we are learning these days that in order to create an application that you want to make available for people in a different organization, it's just not a great idea to try to manage the usernames and passwords, the, the actual database of accounts directly in that application. It just it gets unwieldy over time. Now for that reason, technologies like Federation have begun to spring into existence. Federation is the it has a lot to do with trust. And in fact, um, you may have heard me say in the past before that trust is the vehicle that the internet really runs on. You know, when you go to Amazon and you punch in your credit card, you do that because you trust Amazon. And the, 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 the vehicle for facilitating that trust are the certificates that Amazon has laid into place and the security controls they've laid into place to protect your credit card. Well, in the application space, where again, I've got these two different companies that I need to provide access to. Well, in that application space, I can end up providing a, same, or a similar sense of trust between, gosh, he's got a really big head over here, <laughs> between company2.com and uh, company.pri as well. So here is now my application in company.pri. And also in company.pri is probably a domain controller for Active Directory. And one assumes that over here in company2.com, there's probably also Active Directory domain services as well. So now, here's where Federation comes into play. Rather than having to do any kind of separate database of usernames and accounts, no, we've, we've already agreed that that's just a bad idea. Let's have this application then just turn to my existing Active Directory as the location where I determine access for the application. You're doing this already. Right? You, uh, when you determine who gets access to what apps, you probably create users and groups in your Active Directory for determining who has the rights. Well, let's say that in addition to being able to do that, we can also, via some mechanism, determine that if this user has successfully, this user in the other company, has successfully authenticated to their company's Active Directory, in other words, their company's Active Directory and the, the database that's associated with their company's Active Directory, if that authentication is successful, and if the user meets certain characteristics, like they've, they've got a white hat, uh, that they, they smile really big, that they've got a really big head, if they meet certain characteristics, then we are going to trust the fact that they have completed this authentication and then grant them access to the application based off of the existing trust that we have with that other company's Active Directory domain structure. Now, this may at first kind of blow your head off because, wow, why would I trust somebody else's Active Directory uh, rather than trusting my own? But think again about that whole idea of having to have this locally attached database. What would you trust more? The fact that their Active Directory is correct and their Active Directory has been, you know, the bad guy has been removed from their AD and the, the, the guy that left has been removed from their AD, or that you can do a better job than their own IT professionals. Right? Think about that for a second. 
in reality, it's probably likely that their Active Directory people are going to be a little more on the ball with keeping those, uh, those bad people out of Active Directory than are you in trying to figure out who these people are and if they still exist inside the organization. Now, Federation accomplishes this through a whole bunch of extra vocabulary. And I told you that uh, you know, we're going to have to deal with a lot of vocabulary here in this nugget because, well, if we go much beyond the vocabulary, we start getting into uh, developer type things and building websites that we probably are not ready to get used to. And the, the, the added vocabulary essentially talks about who owns the account as opposed to who owns the application. And then in what direction does the trust flow? So, for example, in this situation where I have an application that I want somebody else to use, and I know that they have some source of identity, some identity source that exists in that remote location. The Active Directory database in that remote location is what we think of as a claims provider. The, the claims provider is the database itself. And so, once I authenticate to Active Directory, well then, Active Directory also has a variety of just possible attributes that I can associate with the user, like their, their, their email address, their, uh, what groups they're in, local groups over here, uh, their city they're in, their site they're in, any of the stuff that we normally associate with you know, an, an Active Directory user account. Well, the claims provider here can take certain attributes, whatever ones we're interested in, and use that as a mechanism to deliver the results of the authentication, the claims that we then identify out of that authentication, the, the, the attributes that I'm interested in sending in this direction, over to my location over here where I have some Federation server set up. In fact, I should move this arrow over here because that's really where it goes. This Federation server over on my side is then what we think of as a relying party. Relying, lying, goodness gracious, relying party. And the relying party in this, this case is really just the application that I'm interested in federating. This relying party is relying, quote unquote, on the claims that are being delivered here from this alternate location. And so when my happy little user over here attempts to use this application, well, part of the use of that application is this user also sending any claims that they have that, that are necessary from their own internal Active Directory authentication that are accepted by the relying party to say, you know what, this person should be authorized for use of the application. And, and that's, that, that's really it. That's, that's kind of, you know, when you, you start digging into Federation, you start thinking, wow, this is really difficult. But it's actually not that difficult when you start thinking about how the trust ends up working. And the first thing you may be saying is, is, well, gosh, well, how do I determine what these claims are? And how do I determine what the format should be for the claims? And how do I determine, you know, all this other, you know, stuff that is kind of custom for determining whether or not this person should get access to it? Well, for claims-based authentication to work, your organization on this side and the organization on the other side need to agree on the format for exchanging the claims. So when I have a claim and it gets sent over here, probably through some encrypted connection, that claim needs to be have some agreed upon format, right? I can either retrieve it from an attribute store. So I, you know, you have a white hat, poof, there's your claim. I can calculate it based on the retrieved values from an attribute store. So uh, if user, uh, if user has a, a white hat, uh, then uh, return, I don't know, one, whatever your, your calculation would be. Or alternatively, the third item is that you could transform one attribute into another. So uh, if the user has a hat, well then um, call it a, a cat, I don't know. The reason why these are all important is because the application over on this side and the federation server that, that handles the authentication for that application, all you need to do is just agree on the kind of data that's going to come across whenever the user attempts to access the application. And if you guys both agree that if you send across a claim that says that the user is green today, well then good, they can use that application. I, I told you this is all kind of developer oriented because you have to agree ahead of time with that other, with that other party to determine in what order or, or, or in what format you're going to end up sending those claims across. So let's talk about the order in which this whole process happens. 
So let's say once again, we've got our user here and this is company2.com and this is the user and uh, then over here is company.pri and in this case I've got the user and they're on their little desktop here and the user on their desktop needs to come back over here to company.pri to access an application. So here's this application, probably a web application, so we'll call it a web app. What is the order in which these things happen? So the first step in the process is the user over here opens a web browser to open a connection to this application. They say, hey, you know what, I need to make use of this application. The application is going to retrieve the request and then verify that the person requesting access to the application does not have any kind of uh, tokens or any kind of previous authentications, perhaps in a cookie in that web browser. So the user at this point is not authenticated to the remote application. When that happens, the, the web app is going to go, you know what, you are not actually authenticated. So you actually need to talk to our federation server over here. This federation server then receives the request from the user. So right here's the, the receipt of the request from the user. And the federation server says, hey, you know what? Um, you are actually in uh, some other location. You're a member of company2.com. So you know if you want to access that application, you're going to need to get the appropriate approval from your organization here, company.com. Well, when that happens, the computer then sends out a request to the federation server that sits over here in your local environment. So this is number step five over here. And your federation server over in the local environment says, oh, you know what, you need, uh, you need to be able to access some application. Well, let me then talk to Active Directory here to see if you have the appropriate attributes, the appropriate rights and privileges to access that application. Active Directory can say, you know what, actually that person does have access and here's the information that you'll need to provide to the application in order to be able to say, you know what, you do have the appropriate access. When that happens, then the Federation server goes back to the client who says, hey, you know what, uh, you know what client, here's number eight, here's all the stuff that you need to do to ask the application or, or to tell the application that you are approved. That user then goes back to the Federation server again, this is number nine, and says, hey, here are the claims. I now have claims. These claims say that I have authenticated against my own local Active Directory and that I, here's the authorization to use the application. So the Federation server looks at the claims and says, yeah, okay, no, you're good. So number 10, there you are. You're absolutely good to use that application. Go ahead and use this as a, you know, this information as the approval to, or that's actually 11, this information as the approval to begin using the web application. Now that's 11 steps. But all this happens through redirects, all this happens automatically, all this happens in the background. So all the user sees is the fact that they're attempting to come here to an application and eventually they get access to use that application. The cool part about this is, is that in order to do that, the only thing you have to do is set up the trust and then manage the accounts here in your local Active Directory. Now that's kind of what we're attempting to accomplish here in implementing Active Directory Federation services. In this nugget, I'm going to show you how to install ADFS and then just what the, because you may never get an opportunity to see this, what the actual screens look like for implementing claims-based authentication, including what are called relying party trusts. Now, relying party trusts are the kinds of trusts that are used to send people somewhere else. Okay, so a relying party trust is a trust that happens between two organizations when you want to go send your user to some other application. This is different from the reverse of that, which is called a, uh, a claims provider trust. Claims provider trust is used to accept somebody else's users. So if you're the relying party and you have the application, the claims provider trust is what's used on your side to accept the fact that somebody from somewhere else is coming. We'll talk about how to configure authentication policies as well, essentially how to set these things up so everything functions in the way that you're looking, uh, that, that you're intending for it to do. And then I want to just spend a couple of minutes here on workplace join and, and, and MFA, multi-factor authentication, because I think this is just looking for a couple of quick steps for how to set these up, because turning on workspace join involves a bunch of extra stuff that you may or may not want to necessarily do in your organization. Workspace join is a mechanism for you to allow non-domain join computers 
like those that are uh, bring your own device type computers to access resources that are inside of your domain. So without having to make them domain join resources because I mean they belong to some user, Workspace join allows you to kind of fudge that fact and still give them access to domain resources without it. Uh, you're also familiar with MFA, multi-factor authentication. There's a way here in ADFS to turn on multi-factor authentication so that you can add additional mechanisms of authentication to this whole process that we're talking about. So let's come down here and talk for a bit about just how ADFS gets set up and some of the initial configuration for an ADFS implementation. I have a server here called ADFS1. Okay, and this is a server that's going to sit inside of your domain. It's going to sit on the inside of the firewall. Uh, ADFS1 will be the federation server that will talk with your domain controller. Usually this is a different computer and not a domain controller itself. Implementing federation services starts here under roles and services. And if we come here to ADFS right here, we can install Active Directory Federation services. When we do that, we're likely going to do this on both sides of the trust. So if you're going to do it on your side of the trust, there's probably a federation server that needs to, needs to exist on the other side of the trust in order to handle making sure you send and receive these claims. So let's go through the installation process. And then I want to show you what the configuration screen looks like after the installation completes. Once we complete the installation, obviously we've got a couple of configuration steps to do. When we come up here to our post-deployment configuration to actually get the whole thing kicked off, so I know I told you back in uh, actually a couple of nuggets ago when we were talking about certificate services that how awesome it was to have your own local ADCS. You wouldn't have to buy certificates. Well, as you can imagine here in a situation where I may potentially be exposing applications to people in other companies that don't have access to my root server, this is a really good example for when you would want to use publicly trusted certificates. So you don't have to end up shipping them your root server to or your root certs in order to keep the certificate chain uh, correct. So good idea here to use publicly trusted certificates. I am going to create the first federation in a federation server farm. A little later on, uh, if, if you want to add additional servers, you can do that. You kind of got to treat these federation servers like domain controllers in that if you lose one and you don't have another one, you're going to lose access to the application. So definitely consider put it, building these things in more than one server configurations. Um, you need to identify a domain controller or a domain admin account for installing uh, ADFS. And then we're going to need a, an SSL certificate here in order to encrypt the traffic that we'll be dealing with here within Federation Services. Now, that certificate is not available by default. So in order to create it, I need to bring up the MMC. And I want to show you the type of certificate that's needed here under computer account. And if I go to personal here and choose to request a new certificate, I'm going to do this against my local CA. You would probably go through your normal. I would download a, a certificate from GoDaddy or VeriSign process. But if you want to just test this out in your own environment, you can just create your own certificate of type computer. That's the type of cert that we need to do here for this, for this particular use. And if you've done everything correctly, then we come back here to our Federation Services, and you'll see that the certificate appears here as the, the cert we can use for SSL. You need to provide a display name here for the Federation Services. Um, if you've got multiple ones, you can you know, tailor those down to specific uses, but I'll just put company here. You need to create an account which I can use. That can either be a group managed service account or just an existing account. You know, feel free to use whatever account works for you. I will, you know, use the one you're not supposed to being my account. Uh, and then do you want to use a SQL database or a Windows internal database? So remember, you are going to be creating some claims here if you're going to be using this as a um, on the, the claims provider side. So those claims got to get stored in some location. A variety of other stuff has to get stored in a location too. So depending on the, your needs, you may end up creating a SQL Server database or a Windows internal database. As I said before, with ADRMS, probably one of the biggest reasons to move to SQL Server is... Um, well, is, is the size limitations of Windows internal database, but also the backup and recovery limitations that exist there as well. Review your options and then run through the prerequisite checks. And then if everything goes well, we'll complete the installation. So let me pause things one more time and I'll finish this installation. Then I want to show you what the, uh, the console looks like for ADFS and where you'll actually go about configuring your claims and dealing with all the trusts and the other bits that are required to get ADFS up and operational. And we're back.
So you can see here we've got the ADFS console up and running. And I'm going to kind of play two roles with this console because I'm going to assume that we'll just we'll kind of play pretend here so that we can see the console on the claims provider side and then also the, the, the console, how it would be used on the relying party side as well. I think it's easiest perhaps if we, again, kind of draw my little diagram so we can see the difference between the two organizations. So this is, right, this is company.pri. This is the application that we're looking to federate. And then over here is our uh, company2.com organization. In order for us to be able to set up this relationship so that the users in this other location can access the application that's over here, we have to set up a series of trusts. And these trusts are done just like a lot of trusts are. They're, they're done from each side to the other side. Now, there are a couple of different kinds of trusts you have to be aware of. The first is a claims provider trust, and the second being a relying party trust. And it's you, you think of these as you create the trust on the side that is opposite of the name of where you're going. So it's sort of like where you're going for the trust is the kind of trust you're doing and not where you are. A claims provider trust, so this is the claims provider right here, claims, oops, that's actually my bad, uh, the claims provider is over here because here's where that local act directory server, the claims provider is over here in the remote location and the relying party is on this side, party is on this side because it has the application that's going to make use of that remote active directory infrastructure. In this situation, a, real, a claims provider trust, claims provider trust is created on this side and points to that into that location. And a relying party trust is created on this side to complete that connection in the other direction. The claims provider trust is going to point to the federation server on the other side that ends up talking to that active directory. And the relying party trust is going to point to the federation server on this side. And very specifically, you'll be pointing to a specific web service or a web URL that will be the location where all of this handshaking can occur. Let's start by looking at a claims, or actually at a uh, uh, claims Provider Trust. The Claims Provider Trust helps you add, as it says here, a new claims provider to this configuration. Right? This is how you can recognize the claims provider, how you can consume the claims that that other Active Directory server is going to, or, or whatever you know, authentication database is going to provide when users end up coming in your direction. So the way in which you accomplish that is by punching in, for example, the metadata address for the claims provider. A lot of times that's a URL. Sometimes they'll give it to you in terms of a file. You can also punch in that information manually if you want. Uh, but essentially, I've got to be able to know where to go or where to point people when they need to, uh, when they need to come in and access that resource. So if I punch this in manually, then I can give it a display name. I claim, oops, uh, someone else's, someone else's claims provider. And then set up a profile for it. Is it ADFS or the previous version of ADFS? Uh, what is the, uh, the services that are supported by the, in this connection? And then what is the identifier for that connection? So again, this is going to be provided for you probably by the application you're looking to, to, to work with or even its developers. Uh, I'll just punch in something bogus here, so whatever uh, dot whatever dot com. And then the certificates that are going to be used. Right? These token signing certificates are those that are going to be made available for you for signing the data as it goes across. Once we're done, we add that trust and that completes one side of the, the, the connection. Flipping over now to the other side of the connection, I need to repeat that process with a relying party trust. And a relying party trust says, okay, well, I am the relying party, I, or I'm the, I'm the claims provider, and I need to get information about that application that um, needs my users need to access. So in order to do that, I have to set up a trust so that I can determine what data in order to, to send it to tell it that this user is, uh, is authenticated and is allowed to use that application. Same thing as before. That can come through a URL or through a file, or I can punch it in manually if I want. Someone else's application there, choose next. 
the profile, the certificate to be used, if I have a certificate, the services that it supports, and the identifier. So uh, again, another web address, so whatever.whatever.com. Now when you do that, when you set these things up, you have the ability to turn on this multi-factor authentication. You can configure it if you want, and you can also configure it based off of where that uh, or where that connection is coming from. So if a user is accessing the application from, for example, an intranet, you might not necessarily need MFA turned on because you're already sort of inside that same organization. If it's coming via the extranet, well, then maybe you want to have some multi-factor authentication to confirm that the user and the device, for example, are actually approved. I can determine if it's for registered or unregistered devices, then I also determine which users and groups should have access to it as well. There is a way, I will tell you, to turn on a global setting here for MFA, and I'll show you what that looks like here in just a second for determining what, what the multi-factor bits of this might be. And then down here under next, we can choose what our, our authorization policy will be. Uh, do I want to permit the users or deny the users access to this relying party? Now, all this happens because of a variety of claims, again, flipping back now to the claims provider side, uh, the, the variety of claims that I'm extracting from this connection through, for example, Active Directory. These claims here uh, are defined by the claim type, which is defined here by some HTTP address. So these are the things, for example, that we can use as mechanisms for determining whether this person should have access or not. I don't have to then create a full Active Directory trust. I can just say, if this person exists and, and fulfills this claim requirement, well, then they should have access to uh, make use of that application. The claims here are gathered through one or more attribute stores. These are, by default, Active Directory. And Active Directory just simply just gathers the content and makes available the possible things that we can use as claims. Now, when I'm setting up these claims, I can set up some global policies as well. They are the primary authentication and the multi-factor authentication policies here. Uh, when I'm authenticating users, either inside or outside, do I want to do so using certificates? Do I want to do so via forms? So having a person punch in the username and password through a form. Uh, and then how do I want to handle things if I'm inside the environment? Now, obviously, if I'm inside, I can use Windows authentication because probably that person is already attached to the domain for one reason or another. Multi-factor then allows me, again, here, this is a global policy to determine what the additional factor of authentication will be. And by default, we have certificate authentication as the additional authentication mechanism that we can use. Now, I told you that I didn't want to spend too much time on workplace join because it is kind of an advanced topic, but there are a couple things you should just be aware of if you do intend on implementing workplace join. Uh, remember, workplace join is a mechanism for you to be able to take non-domain join devices and give them access to domain resources. And if you can imagine, just in the, the same situation that we've been discussing here, it, that's more or less the same sort of situation where I've got with my multiple my multiple businesses, where instead of company.pri and this being company.com over here, this ends up being one or more just different devices that are out there out in the world. Your bring your own device situations. In this bring your own device situations, you want to get access to some resource. Well, then you get access to that resource based off of federation as opposed to having to make this actually some Active Directory enabled device. In order to do that, the, just the basic steps I think that are most relevant for this exam. This is not the entire how to turn this thing on, how to make it function in totality, but the steps I would be aware of are the fact that you need to enable device authentication for it to work. And then there is a commandlet that you should be aware of or actually two commandments you should be aware of. Uh, one, to initialize, in other words, to, to, to prepare Active Directory for device registration, and the other one to enable the device registration service. The first is initialize uh, AD device registration, and then the second is enable AD EFS device registration. Those two commandments just look like ones that I would be aware of for the exam. Um, and there's, like I said, there's more here to workspace join, but these, these are the things that appear to be relevant for passing that 70-412 exam. 
So what have we talked about in this nugget? We have, I will freely admit, sort of punted on a lot of the topics here in ADFS because, I mean, gosh, how far are we into this nugget? And we've just barely broke the surface of what's necessary to get an ADFS infrastructure up and running. It is, I don't know, it's just ridiculous that Microsoft is including all of this content for what is possibly three questions on that exam. Prepare appropriately is probably the best advice I can give you. Uh, we've talked about how to install ADFS, uh, the initial configuration of ADFS, how to implement claims-based authentication, including, in fact, we did relying party trusts and also the claims provider trusts as well. Talked about creating those authentication policies and just spent a very quick minute on workspace join and some of the policies you can set up for multi-factor authentication. Trying to keep things tightly focused here in on passing that exam. Uh, coming up next, we've got a couple of nuggets to finish out this series that I think you will be very happy to know are far less complex than the ones we've talked about here with ADFS and ADRMS. Have to talk about backups and then have to talk about recovery as well. Those have been split up into two different nuggets so that we can focus on the backup task and how backups integrate with VSS and how backups can now integrate with Azure. And then later, just things you need to know to restore store a server. That's the topic for our next nugget. So until then, I hope this has been informative for you and I'd like to thank you for viewing.